We go on. All right, y'all turn to Exodus chapter 30. We're going to continue talking about the tabernacle today. We're going to move to the next piece of furniture, which is the laver. And all we're really going to do is do again, just preach Christ from the next piece of furniture because it all represents Jesus Christ. Hey, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege of calling you our Father. We thank you for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for your word. And above all things, we thank you for Jesus Christ who died for our sins that we might live. Father, we ask that you build us up and satisfy us with your word today. If there be anyone that's never trusted Christ as their Savior, put it on their heart in such misery in their condition until they finally call on you. In Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. 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 Alright, now in Exodus chapter 30, we're just going to read the description. <clears throat> Verse 17. Now remember, God is telling Moses how he wants him to build this tabernacle. And a tabernacle is just a tent. And i got a picture of it up here. It's got a cord around it, and it's got the actual tabernacle tent itself in here that we're working towards. But so far, we've started outside and seen that outside the gate out here is a type in Scripture of being outside the body of Christ. It's lost. And this is where they sent lepers and whatnot. We looked at that. But then you come through the gate, and there was no other way in here. You had to come right here. And Jesus Christ said, He's the only way to, to the Father. You've got to come through there. The first piece of furniture that you come to when you come through that door, and I'm calling it furniture for lack of a better word, is the altar. Now the altar is a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. And what did they do on this altar? Sacrifice. They sacrificed. Sacrifice. Now this is called the outer court out here. And in the outer court I've got justification. Because atonement and purification took place at these two things. You could not, no priest could come inside of here unless he come through here and through here. And what we're going to look at today is this was not just a one-time deal. It's ongoing. So then, in order to get into the inner holy place where the communion with God, the sanctification of a believer is, with the light, with prayer, and with the bread, you've got to come through the cross and you've got to come through the cleansing. And this cleansing ain't got nothing to do with water baptism. And ultimately, we're working our way towards the ark, which is the throne of God. Okay, now, we're going to read here about the labor. Verse 17. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass. Remember, brass stands for judgment in the Bible. And his foot also of brass to wash withal. So then right away we see this thing's for washing, isn't it? He said, Thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. Thou shalt put water therein. Now before we go any further, I want you all to remember, where were they at when they're going to build this thing? In the desert. In the desert. Was there any water? No. The Bible says they didn't have any water. It wasn't nothing to eat, folks. That part of the, the world is the most barren place. Then where did they get the water to fill this labor? From the Lord. Where did they get their water? Right. Moses smote the rock. And the rock, the Bible tells us, that rock was who? Right. Christ. Then who's in this lava symbolically? Right. Christ. The living water in here for the washing and the cleansing, right? It's no different. Look, each one of these in the book of John, Jesus identifies himself as each one of these with a, with a title of God. I am, right? Now, John said, behold, the Lamb of God, didn't he? Here's your Lamb. Jesus told the woman at the well, I am the living water. You believe on me and living water comes to you. Then he went and pronounced himself to be that water at their uh, festival of tabernacles. But we could go on. He's the light. He's the shepherd. We, we'll go right on with it. But now he says the next verse. Verse 19. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. So then who's the only ones that can wash at this labor? The priests. Now, this is very important. This was not for all the tribes, was it? It was for the priests. What are we told the body of Christ believers are today? Priests and kings. Spiritual priests and kings. We don't need to bring God an animal. That's none like that. We don't even need to bring God anything physical. We don't need to bring Him physical tithes. We don't need to bring any offerings like that. What kind of offerings does it say He wants from us? Spiritual offerings. First one is to believe on His Son whom He sent. And from that point, it's thanksgiving and praise, isn't it? He said, the writer of Hebrews said He wanted the sacrifice of the lips, didn't it? 
Matter of fact, even in the Old Testament, he told Israel, who he told to bring these sacrifices, that they had completely corrupted the entire system. And he said, I'm so sick of it, basically. He said, when you bring your sacrifices, when you kill a bull, it's like you cut off a dog's head. He said, I'm full of your sacrifice. Your incense is an abomination unto me. Was it because it was physical or because of the manner in which they were doing it? Did they come to God realizing that that animal was the shedding of blood for them so they could approach God through a substitute or did they come with their chest stuck out? Look what I brought God. Now all across our country today, folks, people are going to buildings and I don't mean all of them, but people are getting up and going to church with the idea they're dressed to the nines and they've got who's got the nicest hat and who's got the best it, and look what I've done for the Lord and they pass a basket and I was once sitting in a pew when I was young and it really made an impression on me. They passed the, the plate, you know, whatever they called it. I was Catholic, but they pass it around and they send it down the aisle and my mom got her money out of her purse, but it come to my aunt first and my aunt threw a five in there. As soon as she threw a five in there, my mom had a couple bucks. Guess what my mom started doing? Digging deeper. Why? <laughs> She's right, folks. You can't be out to see. That's visible, physical, outward religion. And the Bible says it's an abomination to God. Now, he says in the next verse, the priests are going to wash at this labor. Verse 20 says, when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Is this a serious deal? Or when they come near the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, so shall they wash their hands and their feet that they die not. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and his seed throughout their generations. So think what this is picturing then. The people come here. Now, the priest has the job of standing between the people and God, so to speak, in this service, doesn't he? And the people need what is offered at this altar. But the priest is the one that has the, the authority to offer, did not it? And in order for the priest to serve at this altar or to come into this holy place, what had he better do? Wash. 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 Why his hands and his feet? Why not his face? It represents something. We're going to see in a minute. But I want you all to think about the spiritual priesthood. Do you have something that the lost world needs? Folks, we got the gospel, we got the story, the tale, the whatever you want to call it, the facts of Jesus Christ died for the sin of the world. Every person you run into out there, is that what they need? Yeah. Even if they're saved, they need to be edified by the gospel, don't they? Yeah. But can you and I do that job if we're filthy and unclean? No. Folks, y'all know we make ourselves unclean in appearance and in our own minds. Folks, we'll do something and get into something and make ourselves so if it will say, well, I ought to talk to him about the gospel, but I ain't even worthy. Y'all know how we get. How about to, have to come into the communion with God? Look, that's, a, that's approaching the people in service, isn't it? Reverse it. How am I going to come to God in prayer when I got my hands filthy? Y'all know what will happen. I've told y'all before, Moody, y'all know D.L. Moody, famous preacher. When he died, they found written in the front of his Bible, this book will uh, take you out of sin, and sin will take you away from this book. Will sin take you away from God? Sure. Don't mean you can lose your salvation if you're saved, but will you get into a situation where you just, y'all know we get into stuff and we don't even want to look at the Word of God. Y'all know how we are. He heard a, a preacher one time talking, he said this young girl was at a church meeting, and said he was was a guest speaker there preaching. He said he looked at her. He said, I've never seen a sadder face than this girl had. He said she just looked horrible, this young girl sitting there. And said the lady said, oh, she's a pitiful case. She's been this way for a couple years. And afterwards, he, she, he went up to talk to her. And she said, well, I, I used to believe what you're talking about. But I just, I don't know if I believe it anymore. I, I mean, he said, well, when did you, did, did you all, you know, she said, oh, I used to read the Bible every day. He said, well, when did you stop? She said, about Thanksgiving last year. And he said, well, what happened about a week before Thanksgiving? And she looked at him and she started crying. Well, guess what had happened? She got involved in something and that she never should have been. And it got her in such a state of mind that what did she do? She turned from God in guilt, didn't she? Well, that day he showed her and, and with the word of God cleansed her from that and showed her, hey, Jesus Christ has died. He, he, he's, he's made provision for this. The next day she came and said the old lady to run the place said, boy, look what a difference in her today. What was the difference? Turned back to God. She just turned back to God. 
as the, as the old fellow said one time, we're like mirrors. We're supposed to reflect his glory, right? And God is no respecter of mirrors. Any little shard of glass that you point at the sun, will it reflect? Mm -hmm. It will. Now, this thing is for washing. Now, the first thing we need to do is go back to chapter 29. There's a great picture here. Now, do we have the authority from the Bible to make uh, all these scriptures point to Christ? Yeah, the Bible says Jesus himself said in the volume of the book it was written of me, right? How about he told the Pharisees, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. What scriptures did they have? The Old Testament. He said at that same point, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me for Moses wrote of me. But the problem is, how did Moses write of Christ? All the Old Testament. How did they write of Christ? In plain language, easy to be understood? Mysteries, yeah. Mysteries veiled symbols and types, didn't they? For instance, God said, I'm going to bring the seed of the woman into the world. I bet Adam and Eve looked at each other and went home that night and said, the seed of the woman? No, the man has seed that produces a child. What is the seed of the woman? Was that plain language or was that veiled in mystery? Yeah. But what did the Apostle Paul say we've got on this side of the cross? The veil's been ripped off. We've got the New Testament and we've got a clear explanation that all of that was about Christ, don't we? Now he says here in verse 29. Uh, they, verse 29, 29. Chapter 29, verse 1. I'm sorry. Thanks, Zoe. All right. It's interesting too in the instructions for this. Before he ever consecrates a priest, he makes all the garments and vessels for them. In other words, it's all laid out beforehand, preordained, set, before he ever names Aaron priest. Everything's made for him. Now watch in 29 what it says. He's telling Moses, who's a type of Christ, this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them, to hallow them, and hallow just means set apart, to sanctify, to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Then before they could be a priest, this had to happen, didn't it? He said, take one young bullet and two rams without blemish, so what's the first thing we know had to happen before they could serve? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Blood, right? Let's go ahead and write the blood up here. Blood. Now, remember what blood does. Blood is for atonement. Right? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. What required the shedding of blood? What had God give them that demanded blood be shed? The law then could they approach God having broken His law without the blood? No. So the blood removed the legal obstacle, didn't it? But it didn't do anything about the moral. The, no. the law couldn't cleanse their mind. It couldn't touch it, could it? No. But boy, that laver can, or laver, I keep saying. I had to learn how to re-say that. <laughs> so watch what they do with the, uh, after the blood, verse 4. Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Thou's Moses now. And thou, Moses, shalt wash them with water. Notice he didn't say their hands and their feet, did he? How much of them is he going to wash? All of them. Do they have to be totally washed by Moses? Now, in the Old Testament, flip over to Hebrews 9. In the Old Testament, did they have a physical covenant? They did. Did it have physical ordinances and physical feast days and physical where it was all physical, wasn't it? And what are we told all those things pointed forward to? Right. Spiritual troops in Christ, right? For instance, they had physical circumcision that made you a member of that elect nation, didn't they? Could you get into that nation without that physical circumcision? Can you get into Christ without the spiritual spiritual circumcision made without hand? But we don't require physical, do we? Well, they had diverse washings too. Folks, when John the Baptist told those people to get baptized or wash themselves, did the Jews say, what is this washing? No. no, they knew all about it. Well, if they had physical washing, do you think we have physical or spiritual today? Yeah, spiritual. spiritual. Now, I'm not saying anybody that gets water baptized is lost. Look, that's a tradition that came over into the church because the church started as Jewish and they could not separate the thing, and so a lot of that came in. But watch what it actually uh, says back here in Hebrews 9. Huh. Verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. 
For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And he goes down and names all the things. But look at verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God, but into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost this signified, then did all of that signify or symbolize something? Mm -hmm. Yes. That the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So then could anybody just approach God under Moses' law? Mm -hmm. Well, why not? Moses' law made provision for approaching God. Yeah. You could go directly to the throne of God under Moses' law and bypass that priesthood completely if you'd just be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. yeah, mm -hmm. be perfect. Yeah. If you were perfect, if you kept the law perfectly. I, it's so sad today to talk to folks and they say, well, I'm, I hope I go to heaven. I, I mean, I try and keep the commandments and it's so sad. If you break one, what are you guilty of? Oh, you wow. broke them all. If you want that to be your means of satisfying God, you're going to have to be just as perfect as Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, that's one way to get to heaven. And only one person's ever got there that way. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, if I admit I'm a sinner, I've broke the law. Look, I'm guilty of all of the law. You say, well, you haven't actually done those things. I've thought about them. And even if I haven't thought about them, I know that it's just a matter of time before they do cross my mind. The root of all of that stuff is in there. That law was never to point outward at anybody. Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount took that law and turned it around and did what it was for. He stuck it right into them, didn't he? He said, the law says, thou shalt not kill. And some Jews said, well, I've never killed. He said, but I say. Now, what's more important, what the law said or what Christ said? Right. He said, I say, if you got hatred in your heart, you killed already. Anybody drove down airport at five o'clock on a Friday? <laughs> Have you been ready to kill anybody? <laughs> I mean, y'all know it, you, we lose our temper like that, don't we? The law says, Jesus said, thou shalt not commit adultery. So a man said, well, I've never done that. So I'm worthy. I'm better than the other guy. Jesus said, but I said, if you've looked at a woman with lust on your heart, you've committed adultery already. Now, someone would say, well, when I get older, I'll get all that will go away. Sure. No, it won't. I went to my granny's house. She was 80 years old. I went to visit her and she wasn't in her kitchen or at the front. I didn't understand. She was still in the bedroom in the middle of the day. I'm like, what in the world? I opened her bedroom. She said, come on in. I walked in there and she's sitting this far from the TV watching Magnum P.I. Y'all remember that? <laughs> remember that show? And my 80-year-old granny told me that's the sexiest man I've ever seen. <laughs> Folks, I'm glad I heard that because number one, look, I, I thought she, the world of her, but I know she's a sinner. But did it ever leave her mind? Well, then I know something. It's never going to leave my mind either by my own power. So now he says here, all these things, uh, verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. Notice, were offered. So then these ordinances and offerings, are they for me and you? No, folks, the law stopped at the cross. That they were offered, both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now think about it. The law addressed the flesh, didn't it? Yeah. Hey, they had, look, they had something that could exactly correspond here. The reason the priest had to wash, the first time he had to be washed to even be a priest because he's dirty, Right? But then from that point forward, the whole time he serves, he's got to wash his hands and his feet. What's his hands touching? Sacrifice. His sacrifices and his works. Yeah. His dirty works. Hands are what we work with. Are our works dirty in the flesh? Yeah. And his feet are touching the world. Folks, a saved person, after we're saved, lives in two dirty places. The world and the flesh. And both of them can defile you. Now, Jesus Christ said to those Jews that had the idea that they were clean, the Pharisees, not all Jews, but the Pharisees had the idea that they were clean and pure and don't touch this, it'll make you dirty. Don't touch that, it'll make you dirty. And Jesus Christ said, none of those things can make you dirty. The dirty thing is inside of you and you pour it out of you. He said, from within the heart of men proceed. And then he named 13 evil things, didn't he? Then where's the problem at? 
It's in me and you. We are born with a sin nature that is opposed to God. If you don't think you're born wanting to be in charge of yourself, you're not being honest. Folks, we belong to the Lord, and yet who wants to call the shots? We do. We do. I can take a two-year-old kid, let him come in here, and I say, you can write with all those markers if you want, but don't use that red one, and what will he do? Use the red one. He's going to want to use that red one. You say, well, he's a kid. You think you're different? No. Boy, let Lexi be cooking something and say, now that's not for you, that's for so-and-so. And I look at it, and instantly inside of me, right? It's y'all know how it does. See what it really boils down to. Y'all are laughing, and I'm gonna tell y'all something that confirms your guilt to me. I know you're guilty. What happens is, who are you to tell me what to do? Right now, when God told uh, Adam, you can have all of it, didn't he? Folks, he gave him the entire earth in every direction except for that one tree. Don't eat from that one tree. And instead of saying in his mind, God in his infinite love for me is trying to save me from that tree. There's something not good in that tree. He saw it as God is trying to keep something from me. And from that moment, what happens? He going to want to eat of that tree. All it took was one law. One to prove what? Guilty. Guilty. Now you can fight that guilty verdict if you want. And you can just, I mean, you can rise in society to be the, the cleanest living judge in the circuit system. And you'll go right to hell. Or you can acknowledge that guilt and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died for it. Now, if you could be a good enough person uh, in order for God to accept your good works, then why did Christ have to die? He, God could have just accepted your good works. Because God put a contract into effect. The contract was the law of Moses, and what did it require? Perfection. So then what was it going to take? Perfection. So then who had to come? Christ. Right. Folks, the judge issued a, a, a law that no one could keep. He then issued a sentence that everyone was going to have to face, and then the judge got down from the thing, took his robe off, and walked out around there and took on the sentence and the judgment on himself. He did it all. He proclaimed the guilt. He died in our place. Now, it says here in verse uh, 10, These things that they did, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings. What would we call those? Various washings or baptisms. Did they have all sorts of washings in Moses' law? They did. But what does Paul say in Ephesians? How many baptisms does the church have? One. one. Someone says, that's right, one water baptism, and then they all want to argue over sprinkle, pour, dip, do it this way or that way. Well, we're going to see the baptism. Um, he's, huh? Friday I had a fellow tell me that the secretary called him at the Methodist church to pray, if he'd pray on Sunday for him, and... He said, yeah, and then the preacher found out about it, and he had never been baptized there. And they told him he couldn't pray for him. Oh. Beautiful, isn't That's it? right. Beautiful. All right, now, and, and look, I'm sure the man probably means, well, he's been taught that. Mm -hmm. How in the world could physical water keep you in Christ or put you in Christ or bar you from Christ? Mm -hmm. It can't. What did Jesus Christ tell that woman at the well regarding that real water she had? He had I got the real water, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Now it says here, verse 11, or verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal or physical ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. When was the time? I don't mean the Protestant Reformation. When was the time of Reformation? The cross. So then if I put a timeline up here, God gave Israel a system of worship, didn't he? And it was added, 1,500 years before the cross, it was added, wasn't it? And when did it end? At the cross. Now, at the cross, people say, we call it the new covenant because there had been an old covenant, right? But it's only new in, in, to the people that had the old. What had already been around since before the foundation of the world? The old covenant. The new and really, like so, he said, it's the old one, isn't it? Yeah. So then this was God's plan all along, right? When did he activate that plan? At the cross. At the cross. Okay. 
And now today, do we keep Moses' law or do we keep the law of Christ? The law, of Christ. The law of Christ. So he says, verse 11, But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. I could say by a greater and a more perfect sacrifice, not of an animal, right? I could also say by a greater and more perfect baptism, not water. I could say all of these things. Now go over to 1 Corinthians 12 and let's look at the baptism. So we can say what we call the new covenant has always been there, but it was hidden. That's right. Through the old it was veiled in the yeah. old. That's right. He, I heard a fellow explain it this way one time, and it was the best explanation I've heard. He said, you got a flower out there, and that flower's still all budded up like that. All the beauty of that flower is in there, isn't it? But you can't see it. What has to happen? It it's got to be opened up. Well, that's what happened when Christ came. He began to explain those Old Testament scriptures. And the apostles couldn't even understand. You know why they couldn't understand? They didn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit yet. And who's the teacher? The Holy Spirit. And I said the natural man without the Holy Spirit cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Men study this book and memorize portions of it and don't even know what it's talking about. You say, that's not true. You don't know about that. Yeah, I did it for years. For years, I'd pour over this thing and study to my own glory and never saw what it was about. Now, he says here in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, he's talking about the body of Christ. The Bible says there's one body and one baptism, one faith. And Paul says how we get into that body. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, for as the body is one, the human body, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So my human body then is made up of all kind of members, isn't it? Who put the body together as it hath pleased him? God. God made this body as it pleased him. Could my kidney say to my heart, let's swap for a week? Can't do it, can it? God put it where it is, and that's where it's supposed to work, right? Well, then what is the body of Christ? The same way. God hath set all the members in the body as it hath pleased Him. Watch how you get in this body. Verse 13. For by. Now by is not with. Right? By. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. Whether we be bond or free. And have been all made to drink into one Spirit. You've been baptized by the Spirit so that you can drink of the Spirit. Think about Aaron. Aaron was baptized in water so that then he could continue to cleanse himself with water, wasn't he? Aaron was anointed as a priest and then Aaron had to keep himself clean to perform the job, didn't he? Does that make sense so far? Alright, now go over to John 13. We probably... well. We probably run out of time and won't get to it today, but you know the altar was made out of brass, bronze, and it was from the offerings that the people offered of all the things they got when they left Egypt. Y'all remember when they, by the time the tenth plague rolled around, the Egyptians said, "Here, here's my pot, here's my wallet, my goat. Take everything and leave to get rid of them, didn't they?" So they left out of there with much spoil, just like God had told Abraham they would. But what did God want them to have all that spoil for? They're going to build this thing, folks. Y'all know what it would cost to build this thing today? Just the gold and the silver. Just the gold and the silver I figured up. And I'm not saying this is an exact number, but I got pretty close. I know what gold's worth and silver's worth. It cost about $220 million today for us just to do the gold and the silver in here. Now, that ain't counting all the other stuff. I mean, that's a lot of gold and silver, isn't it? So then, anyway, they leave out of there. And they get out there into the wilderness and they've got this uh, thing to be built. God has them build the altar out of bronze that they had supplied, but not the, the labor. The labor, when we get to it, it's built out of brass or bronze, but guess what it's made from? The ladies' looking glasses. Mirrors. Folks, they didn't have glass mirrors back then, so they polished metal, didn't they? See, this was a pagan custom. Ladies went to serve false gods and they carried their mirrors with. You can see this in customs today. Y'all have seen in the 1800s those ladies would walk around with a mirror. Yeah, we say it's just a thing of vanity, right? But remember a mirror, mirror on the wall and all that? 
the mirror was an Egyptian custom. It was part of what they worshipped. And they brought incense and a mirror. And it, it was part of what the Jews had learned down there. So these ladies are all assembled. And what does God tell Moses to take out of their hands? Those looking glasses. And do what with them? Make the labor. Now what's this labor a picture of? It's Christ. But it's Christ in what sense? Cleansing. Purifying. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. What's called the mirror that you and I are supposed to look into? The Word of God. Word of God. Can y'all imagine looking at that thing out there in the desert made out of that polished brass fill of water? I mean, that thing would sparkle, wouldn't it? You'd go up there and you'd look in it. Who would you see? Yourself. Yourself. Now, think about the ladies' looking glasses. What once they looked in, you don't look in a mirror to see anybody else. It's for self-inspection, but it's a symbol of vanity and pride, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Where they once looked in the mirror of vanity and pride, now they're to look in this thing and see something dirty and defiled. Mm -hmm. Once I looked in this book, and in pride I saw myself righteous before God, better than the other guy, knowing this, knowing that, oh, I've got the best doctrine and all this. Once it was a mirror of pride for me. But when the Lord showed me what I really was, now I look in this book and I see myself dirtier on every level. Like David said, Lord, search me. Find those deep, unclean things and show them to me. Well, how do you get that shown to you? Right here in this book. Now watch Jesus Christ teach this exact same thing. In John 13, this is the... Uh, we call it the Last Supper. Verse 2. <clears throat> Supper being ended. This is the Passover they took. The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus knowing that uh, the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Now this, me and you think about getting out of a shower and wrapping yourself in a towel, but that's not the idea here. The idea is that he lays aside his normal garments. I would say, you come home from church and you're going to cut the grass. What do you do? You put on your, you take off your church clothes and put on your working clothes, right? He's, guard, he's, he's covered himself with the proper garment for what he's about to do. Verse 5 says, He poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. This is one of the most beautiful pictures in the whole Bible. Have, can y'all imagine the God of all creation kneeling down and washing old dirty feet? Mm -hmm. Now this is the ultimate symbol of service and humility, which is what he came to do. But it's also <laughs> something else. Watch what he says now. He's washing their feet. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Now, y'all know we, we make fun of Peter, but I would have said the same thing, I guarantee you. If I believed Jesus was the Son of God, and like Peter did, and he came to wash my feet, I'd say, oh, no, no, that don't seem right, does it? Then Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Why didn't Peter know then? He ain't had the Holy Spirit before the cross. Folks, don't y'all ever believe that before the cross, the apostles knew anything. They didn't hardly know anything. Did any of them believe Jesus was going to die? No. One woman we can find. Did any of them believe he was going to be raised from the dead? No. When did they begin to believe? After the cross, it says Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. What does that mean? He gave them the Spirit. The Spirit. This is not like people in... in Different buildings claim hooping and hollering and jumping pews and flopping on the floor. Folks, that's not the gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit comes and one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Now, how in the world are you going to claim you've got the gift of the Spirit, which includes self-control when you're flopping on the floor saying you can't handle it? That's people trying to prove with a visible sign that they've got something they won't take by faith. I don't mean they don't, they don't say, I don't know what they are. That's between them and the Lord. But what I know is this. Do you and I need any visible symbol to confirm the promises of God? Absolutely. We walk by faith, not by sight. Lady told me once, she said, do you really believe you've got the Holy Spirit in you? I said, yes, ma'am, with all my heart. She said, prove it. And I said, well, come here. And I started, she said, now wait, I don't believe that book. I just closed it, so I'm sorry, I can't, I can't prove it to you. No comment or There's nothing, I, what can I say? I'm walking by faith. God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it for me. 
Now, Peter says, oh no, you're not going to wash me. Jesus said, you don't know what I'm doing, but you will know. Verse 8, Peter saith unto him, thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not. Notice he doesn't say, if I have not washed thee. This is ongoing, continuing. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. If the priest washes, the priest who's already been washed, if the priest washes not, does he have any part in the service? No. He's been defiled, hasn't he? If somebody watching's already saying, yeah, but Paul never said this. No, Paul said more. Paul said it more clear. We're going to see in a minute. But Jesus says to him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed, there's the past tense washing it, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Now, did he just tell them they were clean? But is he washing their feet? Then there's cleaning, and there's ongoing cleaning, isn't there? See, salvation is in three tenses, three phases. If I drew a, a pie chart like this, what's a man made up of, according to Scripture? Water. water. Mostly water, yeah. yeah. But body, body soul, and soul, and spirit. And spirit. Okay? The day that you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, what did God save? Spirit. You're saved spiritually till the eternal. You'll never die. You'll be with the Lord, and it doesn't matter if you really trust Him. You could later fought murder. Look, I'm not saying don't do that. The Lord's not going to lead you to do it, but it's not based on anything you do keeping you in Christ, is it? No. So you were saved spiritually, past tense. Well, I'm still in this thing now. Yeah. I can't go to heaven. I can't. I jump. I get about that high off the ground. I come right back down. Right. I can't see the kingdom of God. I can't see the holy city. I can see it in the scriptures through faith, but I can't see it physically, can I? Paul said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We must be changed, right? When will the physical change come? In the future. Right. At the resurrection, we shall be changed, right? So that's the physical salvation. Spiritual salvation takes place when you trust Christ. What's in between past and future? Present. What did Paul tell us we need to presently be conforming to God? Our, our minds, our, our us, all our makeup. How are we to cleanse this thing that we call soul? Soul is all your emotion, your thoughts, your experiences. It's your inner person. It's you, right? How are we going to conform that to something? Word. Word of God. By regenerating. Regenerating. Thank you, Mr. Al. Regenerating. And Paul said it's the regenerating of the washing of the water of the Word. How did you get saved spiritually? Word. Somebody preached the gospel to you and you believed them, right? How will you be transformed daily? By His Word. How are you going to be raised? How did the Lord raise Lazarus? Lazarus. Come forth. And what did Lazarus do? Folks, it's by his word. It's by the power of his word. So then there's also a present, isn't there? So there's past salvation when you trust it. There's physical future salvation. And then there's the ongoing daily salvation. What do you mean you need to be saved from daily? Ourselves. Uh, ourselves. We have an unclean heart. And from the moment you're saved, <coughs> you've got two creatures dwelling in one vessel. Old man and a new man. And what do they do? They, they oppose each other. Paul said, that which I do, I allow not. That sounds like a split personality, doesn't it? That thing that I want to go do in the Lord, I don't want to do that. You see what he's saying? What my old man wants to do, my new man knows that's not what God would have me do. But the old man always wants to do it. So you've got to learn to follow God's will in the new man. Now, is this something that happens like that? Folks, you're never going to get it licked. There's, you've never met anybody that rose to sinlessness. There's no such thing. That's not even the goal. Look, if you've got one sin, are you just as much a sinner as you ever were? Yeah. That's like I come in and i got one spot on my head and I tell y'all, hey, i got chicken pox. Is that spot chicken pox or is it in my blood? It's in, it's in my blood. Am I, am I contagious? Yeah. 
Sully comes in and it's covered in red dots. And I say, y'all watch him. He's got more of the chicken pox than me, does he? Mm -hmm. He's just got more visible outbreaks. We both got the disease, don't we? Mm -hmm. We will have that disease in our flesh till the day the Lord comes back. But the Lord has taken care of it, hasn't he? But what is this thing he's talking about then This being cleansed? Conscience. It's got conscience, folks. We yeah. need to be cleansed from the knowledge of our own will. In other words, let's do it like this. God is not looking for sinlessness. What's God looking for? Per perfect dependence upon Him. Yeah, it's obedience to God. It's, it's Lord, what will you have me do? What you know, now, that came to my mind the other day. I, every time I wake up, I think about it. The first thing that comes to my mind is, what am I going to do? I, I, the first thing that comes and it ought to be, what will that have me to do? That's right. But hey, how many times do you think I'm going to wake up in the morning and say, what will that have me to do, Lord? That's an old man gets in the way. That's doesn't right. An old man's in the way. He ain't going to do it. Now, have you ever seen a dual-natured <laughs> creature, flesh and spirit of God, that actually put God's will 100% of the time? Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ right. did it, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Was Jesus Christ, did he have a body made in the likeness of sinful flesh? Yes. Not sinful, but in the likeness. Yes. But was he the son of God? Yeah. He was the first dual-natured creature in the new kingdom, wasn't he? And what are we all the moment we get saved? Yes. Dual nature. There's two kinds of people in the world today. Those that have been born once and those that have been born twice. Can you see the second birth? No. Well, the water baptism produced it. That's something I could say, hey, I got a video of my new birth. Look at it here, huh? See, water ain't got nothing to do with this. This is spiritual. Now, Jesus tells them again, verse 10, he that is washed needeth not to wash anymore, save his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now flip over to chapter 15 and watch how they were clean. You know, if we pay attention in the scripture, we'll see that God is constantly showing, even in the Old Testament, that water couldn't clean anybody, never could. Remember when uh, Naaman, the Gentile with leprosy, was healed? He sent him down there and God told Elisha to have him dip in the Jordan River seven times, didn't he? Why seven times? If the water was going to do anything, he'd have come out clean the first time, wouldn't he? When he went down the first time and come up, y'all reckon he looked? He went down the second time and come up and looked, and what's he beginning to think? We know what he thought, what he had already said. Water in the Jordan ain't no different than the water back home. Well, it wasn't. He went down all them times, didn't he? Then what does that tell you? Did the water cleanse him? No. That God cleansed him, that's right. When he come up the seventh time, it was gone. Obedience to God. He did what the man told him to do in faith. And, it, and his faith was just, I mean, you say he didn't look like he had any faith. No, it was about like a grain of mustard seed, wasn't it? But he went enough to go down the seventh time. Now in John 15, uh, in verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. Now wait a minute. They're already in him, and they're still being purged? What do you do with You got a tomato bush. You plant it and leave it alone, and that's it? No. What do you do with it? Water. You work on it every day, don't you? You water it. We Look, we don't grow grapes, so we, we're uncertain with a lot of these customs of lifting vines up and tying them up away from the ground to protect them and all that. But I know about a tomato bush. I look at a tomato bush every day, and every day I reach up and I pinch something, don't I? Suckers, we call them, don't we? Yeah. Why do you pinch them off? Take it away from they take away nutrients. They don't bear any fruit. Right. But aren't they part of the tomato bush? Mm -hmm. Folks, a person that's in Christ is in Christ. And in the context here, he's not talking about kicking somebody in or out of Christ. He's talking about bearing fruit. Is God going to direct resources to the one that won't bear fruit? They're turned from him. So what does God do? He turns from them and uses another. Now he says here in verse 3, Now ye are clean, through the word which I have spoken unto you. Then how were they cleaned? Through his word. word. By the word. Okay, let's go over to uh, say we go to 1 Corinthians to confirm. We're going to look at something Paul said. 1 Corinthians 6. What 
we're going to see here is all through the Scripture, we're going to see saved men that need saving, redeemed men that need redeeming, cleaned men that need cleansing. I mean, this is it's ongoing, right? Constantly. Now, he says here in uh, chapter 6, verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You know, that verse used to really make me uncomfortable. Is there anything in that list of things that you said, uh-oh? All of them. You, you got it, Sully. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just recently, someone had sent me an email and pointed out the effeminate in here. Isn't it amazing that certain people look at that list of things and focus on effeminate? They don't see anything else in the list, do they? I mean, seriously, they say, well, that, yeah, but the Bible says that that, recently someone made a big, yes, but the Bible says that that's an abomination. We're talking about homosexuality. That's an abomination. Yes, it is. It's a sin and an abomination. And the Bible says so is pride. The Bible says so is a haughty look. Anybody got those? Mm -hmm. You know what the Bible says is an abomination to God? That heart beating in your chest right now. Amen. Now why would I want to focus on any group of sinners? Mm -hmm. You see that's taking the mirror of God's word and looking at everybody else. Well y'all know what you can do with a mirror. When I was a kid we used to burn ants with them. Did y'all do that? You, sh you can take a mirror and shine on another people and hurt them can't you? But what's a mirror designed for? Look Quit looking out there, look at yourself. You look down that list, folks. If you ain't got all them things and you, somebody said, well, uh, no, I don't have this or that. Well, you got the potential for it. It might not have not have crept up yet, but the potential's in there, the book says. Now, he says, none of those things, and if, no one that does those things shall inherit the kingdom of God. So you would say, well, then I'm not going to go to the kingdom of God. No, your flesh ain't going to the kingdom of God. Is your flesh, your old man, righteous or unrighteous? He does all those things, doesn't he? But what does the Bible say the new man is created right. in? Righteousness. In Christ. in Christ righteousness. Can the new man go into the kingdom of God? Yeah. He's already in it, folks, spiritually. We're learning to be in it every day mentally, aren't we? And one day we'll be there physically, won't we? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure that old man is so deceitful, he'll even trick you into thinking he'll give these things up. Yeah, he sure will. Folks, you look, there's an old... I, it, I don't want to use that saying to offend somebody, but there, you, you can't clean up something that's unclean. Look, how are you going to clean up the body, the human body? How are you going to clean it when Jesus Christ said, what's constantly pouring out of it? Yeah. Defilement. Now, y'all know God showed us this. Who took a shower this morning? Who's going to need one tonight? Why? <laughs> You get, dirty. you get dirty from the world, but you could stay in your house all day. You could stay, you know, the dirtiest I ever feel ever is riding in my car all day with the air conditioning. Y'all ever ride in a car all day? How do you feel? Filthy. Filthy. Yeah, you know why you feel? Somebody said, that's all those exhaust fumes. No, it ain't. It's your own body, folks. We secrete something disgusting out of every orifice, don't we? And what does it need? Constant washing. This is what it needs, doesn't it? Now, here's the thing. Verse 11, Paul says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed. How did these Corinthians get washed? By the Word, By the word of God. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, weren't they? Amen. But he's done spent half the book rebuking them for the things they're doing. Hadn't he? Mm -hmm. Don't sound like washed people, does it? So he said, Ye are washed, Ye, now, by the way, it doesn't say you were washed. You look, old, this old English, a lot of times, it, this is where, in my opinion, where we get the most trouble with the King James Version is the, the way they used to put past tense verbs, present tense verbs, and future, per, it's a little different and changing, and we view these things as, as different. Are washed is present ongoing. He didn't say you were washed. You are washed, right? You are washed, ye are sanctified. We would say you are being washed, you are being sanctified, ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And who's doing the washing? God Almighty is the Spirit through what means? The Word of God. So then what do we need? The Word of God. We need the Word of God. Now you could say, well, those are all past tense. Okay, then are these Corinthians saved people? 
Yes, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he calls them saints, doesn't he? He tells them they're part of the body of Christ. Then he rebukes them for some of the vilest sins. One of them was sleeping with his stepmom, wasn't he? You go through the list, they're still involved in pagan idolatry. I mean, it's just a bunch of things, isn't it? So then here he said they're washed, didn't he? We'll go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 7. Second Corinthians seven one. Now are these the same Corinthians? Mm -hmm. Most certainly is. In Second Corinthians seven one, Paul writing to the same group of people. By the way, he said he wrote to them in order that they make corrections, that they would see what they were doing wrong, and they themselves make the correction. Paul said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly furnished unto all good things. You hear what he just said? The Word of God is for the person that's already the man of God who's going to need instruction in righteousness. Do we need it? Yeah. We need it daily, don't we? Now he says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, to these people that have already been cleansed, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Wait a minute. He said they were clean already. What do they need to wash? The hands and their feet. Their works and their walk. This is what we need washing. In the Old Testament, there was one other area added. The blood was put on their ear, wasn't it? The mind, the works, and the walk. Don't we need this constantly cleansed? We do. Now he says, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness or sanctification in the fear of God. Were they already cleansed in one sense? Did they need constant cleaning? Yes. Paul says they're redeemed, and yet they need constant redeeming. Peter says they're purged, and yet they need constant purging, don't they? One more and we'll take a break. Go to 1 John. 1 John 1. Now, is John writing to save people? Yes, absolutely. He makes it very clear he's writing to save people. Someone immediately said, yeah, but he's writing to save Jews. Well, the Bible says in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free. It's all the same, right? Alright, so he's writing to this. He says here in verse 5. 1 John 1, 5. This then is the message which we, he and the writers, have heard of him, declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we, does we include John the writer? Is John the writer saved? He's been saved many years, hasn't he? If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. He doesn't say, if we say we're saved, He said fellowship. Look, it's like this. The priest is already made a priest, but if the priest says he's clean, he can't come in here. The priest has got to be cleansed, doesn't he? What if the priest got the sacrifice and walked around this way? And somebody said, hey, wait, what are you doing? you you got to get the altar. to know I'm clean. I don't need cleansing. What is he? He's a liar. Aren't his feet dirty? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to him when he comes through here? He's going to die. Y'all see what we're talking about here? Yeah. So then he says, if we who have fellowship in here, this is the sanctification section, if we say we have fellowship with him but we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light, notice it's about the walk, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth, what tense is that? Present. Cleanseth us, does that include John? From all yeah. sin. Now, folks, the man just said who saved here that he needed cleansing from sin. What happened on the cross? Jesus Christ died to pay for our sins, didn't he? Mm -hmm. We all we, we say that, but yet let's talk about it before we quit here. Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty that God required for your sins, and what was that penalty? Yeah. Yeah. Death and hell, it's eternal death, isn't it? So then has the penalty been forever paid? Yes. How did God prove the penalty was paid? Raised he raised him from the dead. 
raising him from the dead and setting him at his own right hand proves there's no sin left on him because he couldn't go into the presence of God with it. So the resurrection becomes our receipt, doesn't it? That's why we must believe in resurrection. So then God put all the sin to his account. When he died, he cleared the sin, forgave it, and raised Christ from the dead. Does that take care of the penalty forever? Yes. Gone, right? But, <coughs> anybody, thank you. anybody in here still suffer from sin's effects every day? Sure. Sure. Does sin still have power? Yes. You don't think sin has power, you're lying, aren't you? Yes. Then do I need something else on a daily basis? Yes. I, the penalty's taken care of forever, folks. I don't have one. I'm just as sure that I'll be in heaven as I am that Christ is there because He owns me and I'm His. But I'm in this earth and I'm supposed to be an ambassador growing in Christ and witnessing to Him. And what happens? I get into stuff and make myself unfit for service. i got to turn back to Him and plead with Him, Lord, help me with this. Say, what do we need help with? What don't we need help with? You tried to do anything? Seriously, just try to do anything without the Lord. Better yet, do this, say, I'm going to do it. You'll fail just as sure as I'm sitting here, you're going to fail. Now he says, John, in verse 8, If we, including John, say that we have, present tense, not had, still have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Doesn't mean you're not saved. It means you're not being honest about the thing, right? Verse 9 says, if we, including John, save people, this verse, folks, has nothing to do with the lost world. If we confess our sins, not our sin. Sin is a nature. Sins are the things we do because of that nature. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's ongoing cleansing, isn't it? Amen. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word's not in us. Mm. Folks, if you don't think you're still a sinner, you ain't being honest. Mm. Now, how can you ever get into Christ if you won't admit you've got a sin nature to begin with? Okay. See, that's sin. In Adam all have sinned. That's our nature. David said he was conceived in sin. Did David do anything wrong in his mother's womb? Why was David a sinner then? Because his mom and dad were sinners. They produced a sinner, didn't they? What does that sinner deserve? Yeah. Death and hell. What did Jesus Christ do? Died for that sinner. So then that sinner can be saved and gain eternal life, right? Yeah. But then that sinner's left in this world, living in this world and this flesh. So what's the sinner going to need? Constant cleansing, constant purging, constant saving from ourselves. That's what we need. Okay. Any questions? All right, let's take a break.